And what we're gonna do right now is shoot into a video where I talk about my personal view of the meaning of life, about how to be creative, about who you are as a person, how you can be expansive, how you can be more. And the reason why this particular topic came up is because every day that I walk down the street, people come up to me and they say, oh, and I watch your content, and I gotta ask you a question. And I, I hear this every day, I gotta emphasize. How many psychedelics have you taken? You must be on psychedelics every day. Are you microdosing right now? I hear this every single day. And when I say every day, I mean every single day. Now, why do I track that type of question? Because I've never even smoked weed. I haven't drank since high school, barely ever drank, and I've never personally experienced psychedelics, nor am I planning to. And before you write in five million little comments, you gotta do it! It's not happening. Now, in this video, I'm not here to say that you shouldn't do it. In fact, I would encourage you to do whatever you want, but rather, I simply want to address a piece of information that I really believe you get almost nowhere else. Now, here's why I say that. I'm a huge fan of Joe Rogan. Who in the world isn't? Everybody in the world is going crazy for Joe Rogan right now. He's probably one of the best talk show hosts or, or podcast hosts, whatever you want to call it, that's ever lived. Maybe the best that's ever lived. This guy is, is, is amazing. He, he's a, a hero to, to millions of people and deservedly so. Well, one of his favorite topics is psychedelics. So because it's one of his favorite topics and something that he really feels he benefited from, psychedelics have just really, really increased in popularity. Things like ayahuasca, DMT, magic mushrooms, and other psychedelics, people are now realizing these aren't drugs, so to speak, but these are actually tools to expand your consciousness. They can be tools to heal. They're medicine, they're not drugs, okay? Many of them aren't even fun. They're actually meant to expose you to parts of your personality that you're suppressing, to make you realize that you're part of something much, much more vast than what's in front of you, and to realize that the little me that you think you are is much, much more vast. Now, that being the case, why is it that so many people will think that my content is rooted in psychedelics? Well, I have a sort of a, a weird perspective on this. And the perspective that I've had way before I ever saw Joe Rogan, in fact, I've had this perspective for maybe 20, 30 years, I've always felt this way, is that in the same way that say an ayahuasca journey is you traveling al almost like into another dimension and you experiencing something that is really gonna show you your weak points and it's gonna show you something bigger and broader and it's gonna, in, in many ways, purify the spirit. In the same way that ayahuasca would be doing that, what I've always believed, and it's just a funny belief that I have, is that I think that this life itself is an ayahuasca journey. I've always believed that. My belief has always been that we are a spirit with a body right now. We come to this earth to have our great weaknesses exposed, to learn lessons, and to have many different lessons and, and a journey that we signed up for, and we're here to experience it right now. So funny enough for me, when I hear about psychedelics, that's almost like the movie Inception. It's like a dream within a dream, right? It'd be like if you did ayahuasca, then you're like, in the ayahuasca, you're like, do you also want to do ayahuasca? Then you did another ayahuasca to go a layer deeper, and then a layer deeper. And so my view has been that we have to actually experience this level of the dream, the journey that we're in right now, this journey, and we have to look at it through a lens of becoming expansive, realizing that we're more than what we see, experiencing the most deeply painful lessons, and really letting them land. And so for that reason, and in addition to that, I'd also say a tremendous amount about creativity. We're gonna really, really go deep on creativity in this video as well. So, so, so deep in thinking laterally, kind of like Steve Jobs, right? He said that by doing LSD, he was able to think a lot of ideas uh, that he used for Apple. I wanna show you my creative process and how to think laterally. The major thing that I hope that you get from this video, whether you're into the psychedelic movement or, or not, I happen to not be, is that whether or not you, you go on a journey like that, there's still a process that you're gonna have to undertake one way or the other for you to internalize those kind of concepts. If you wanna be very creative, you've gotta practice lateral thinking. If you wanna realize that who you are is much more vast, you've gotta actually internalize that. When you get a parking ticket, you can't start kicking your car and getting angry. You've gotta really live that and make a decision to be non-reactive to the world, to stay present, and with everything that comes at you, learn to let that move through you and actually allow you to expand. It's supposed to be, these, these frustrating experiences are supposed to be drivers to become more pure, to expand, to become internally stronger. All that is so important, and that's a part of your journey in day-to-day -day life, regardless of what you do. When you're high, my understanding is that it'll kind of draw your feeling into, you know, whether it's a euphoria or, you know, in some cases it could actually be something very scary, but, you know, you know, which could have a healing aspect to it too, but it draws your attention into something, right? Now, understand this. Why do people get addicted on the physical? What we crave is a return to source, okay? What is source? Source would be like 
when you just feel an overwhelming peace in your body that just feels so good, right? So what do we do to try to return to source in the physical world? The first thing that we want to do, we want to come, right? For that, like, three and a half seconds, you have returned to source, right? It's like this overwhelm of pleasurable, it's like, <laughs> like that, right? You get about, you get, basically nature gives you just enough of it that you still have to get back to work. You know, you can't sit, you know, it's not going to give it to you for 12 hours, right? It'll give you just enough of a carrot that you'll be motivated <laughs> to go reproduce, but not enough that you wouldn't go get your work done. <laughs> Why, why wouldn't you even hear that or are curious about it? Well, because we want to go back to source. We want that feeling of pleasure. So how do we try to get it? Either A, coming, B, food, right? Like a really, like, look, let's be honest, right? Something like, say, a little, like a baby carrot stick, it doesn't really overwhelm the senses, you know, right? I mean, maybe for someone in here, but, you know, for, okay, ha, huh, you're, you're so cool. But, you know, for the rest of us, it sucks, okay? And I eat baby carrots, but it sucks. It's like, you're just like, kum, kum. okay, whatever, right? That's very different than like this big, piping hot, fluffy pizza, right? Or this like, well, for those of you who eat healthy, you don't like that. But, or something like say, you know, this amazing gooey chocolate cake, piping hot, or this like warm from the oven cookie, or this like perfectly made taco, or like, you know, whatever it is, right? Like those like fries from McDonald's covered and slathered in sweet and sour sauce, right? What do you guys like who don't like the pizza, by the way? What are you guys into? Okay. Well, there you go. Okay. So, okay. So a big lasagna, right? Well, what, well, what does that do, right? We, we want to recognize the underlying mechanism right there, right? What it does is when you put that in your mouth, you're just, for, at least for like, you know, a big chocolate milkshake, at least for a moment, you're like, it, it, it will kind of like it ensconce your consciousness in like pleasure for a minute. And so it medicates those feelings of just generalized tension that is the burden of all humanity, right? We all have this kind of burden of like, like when is like the last time that you just felt like completely chill? It's actually, it's actually like kind of weirder than you think, right? Like you, you run through life with this kind of low level refrigerator hum of like untargeted anxiety. You don't even know what you're anxious about, right? Then you look for things to sort of to rationalize why you're feeling that. And then what winds up happening is, um, is that you, you want to break from it. You're like, look, I need a break. Like, I just need like an hour to get away from this. So maybe you go to a really good restaurant, right? And that's sort of like a place that you've trained yourself that you can kind of let go and relax. You know, it's sort of like, a, they call that a ritual, right? It's like, it's ritualized relaxation. Like, you know, a lot of cigarette smokers have that, right? It's like, it's not just the cigarette. It's the ritual of like, okay, I'm outside. I'm lighting up. I play with my hands, and it's, it's just sort of a way to escape. They've ritualized, like, okay, this is the time I can let go. For me, it's the, the Russian banya, okay? Um, maybe we'll even go to it this week. Uh, they have a, a banya here in, um, in, uh, in uh, Miami. It's called Russian Turkish Bass. That one's really not the most relaxing. It's kind of weird, but um, it's still amazing, though. And so, like, for me, when I'm in that crazy hot Russian banya, or... This might surprise you when I'm in the cold plunge, actually, for many of you that get into cold plunge, when I'm in the cold plunge, I'm like, I, I have permission to relax. Like, if you ever want to see me, my most shut down and chilling, just see me at the banya, you know? Like, say you know me from as the Owen, the public speaker, like very boisterous and gregarious. You'd see me at the banya, I'd be like, I'm like, right? You're like, hey, you know, I really love video number 82 where you said this and this and like, what's your, what's the extrapolation of that? You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, and, and in my mind, I'm like, that sounds stupid. I'm like, and literally, I think that video, I literally will have the thought, that video is stupid. I'm stupid for making it, and this person's dumb for watching it. That, like, in that moment, when I'm like, <laughs> like that, that's, that's literally how I experienced that, you know? I met Ram Doss once. And he's in, like, this full, like, you know, like, enlightened mode. Now that he's, he's older, he's had a stroke, and he's just like, like this, right? And I'd read this really heady book that he wrote maybe in his 30s or 40s or something, whatever it was, you know, and um, like in his more intellectual prime, right? Now he's more like in his beingness prime. And I was like, you know, in this book, in page 262, you know, you said this. And Rom looked at me from his wheelchair and he was, he was just like, <laughs> right? I'm like, you know what I mean, right? He's like, just hug me. All right? He didn't care. <laughs> I felt so dumb. <laughs> he just had no clue what I was talking about or cared. And, um, you know, because he's a different vibe, right? So in many ways also, and, and that raises another side point, a lot of our more intellectual pursuits, a lot of that can be cultivated actually from angst. 
a lot of my a lot of my really incredible content came from me feeling unhappy and like maybe I'd be happy if I could get this response. Maybe I'd be happy if I could get this response. Maybe I could be happy if I could achieve this. Maybe happy if I could achieve this. Then ironically though, that angst about achievement in one level it drives right? It drives you forward. But in another level, it also holds you back. It's almost like you've got the gas and the brake on at the same time, right? Because the anxiousness is stifling your creativity and it's also depleting you of energy. As I'm sitting here and I'm in my flow and present with my energy, is my energy increasing or decreasing? But if I'm worried and I'm in that kind of stutter mode, and I'm worried about it, ironically, this speech would actually deplete me. That's why some people, they go out for a night of socialize and they come back feeling like they got their face kicked in because they're on this up and down roller coaster. Good reaction, good reaction, oh, bad, oh, good, bad, good, bad, oh. They go home, they're like, oh, <laughs> that sucks. They're, they're, they're exhausted, right? It, you know, but when you do it well, when you do socializing well, it becomes a, you know, more of a meditative practice to get into the moment to control your own state. You actually come home loaded with energy. You don't want to go to bed. You're loaded with energy. You, you feel euphoric. It gets addictive and you keep going out, not even like to hook up. You're actually going out because you're trying to get that euphoric vibe back. It's really what you, you get addicted to. It's really crazy. So in effect, um, think about it like we want to get to source, right? We, we want to be kind of enveloped in a, in, a, in a feeling of beingness, that we are complete as we are, that, that, that there is an okayness in the world. So we get a moment of that from chocolate cake, a moment of that from a sugary drink, a moment of that maybe it could be from massage. Now, the challenge is, is that that's what's called medicating your pain. And you, you're medicating it. So what you're doing is you're in that kind of low vibration state of low level, untargeted refrigerator hum of permanent anxiety. It builds up like a pressure cooker. And so at the end of the week, you're pounding down alcohol, trying to get a release. You worked all week, you're all tense. You need a release really, really bad. So you go, you go and that's why, that's why most of society goes and gets crunk on the weekend. They need that release so bad. They don't know how to release trauma or tension. And so what's happening though, it's also holding them back. Again, that anxiety is driving you forward, but you're not in your creativity and you're being depleted. If you just relax, you might not feel as motivated to, to sprint forward, but the action that you would take would be energizing you and it would be you at your most resourceful and you at your most creative. So you'd be energized, resourceful, creative. You'd resonate with easier solutions. So. Part of getting older is usually when you're in your 20s, when you're younger, you don't really know how to access that. That's just not, that's not a paradigm that you understand how to access. You don't really know the access points. But as you get older, you're gonna go through experiences and you're gonna kind of get a feel for where each of those zones are. And you're gonna get better at kind of relaxing and accomplishing 20 times more, but with like 10% of the energy. You're gonna see that. Great basketball players learn how to do that. Kobe late in his prime before he passed, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, they learn how to, you know, the younger, the, the younger player runs down the lane, gets elbowed in the face and smashes, you know, smashes for the slam dunk. The older player, they're able to manage their energy better. They know where to make an impact. They know where, they're, where, they're, where their spots are. They know how to find their spots. When I was younger, I would probably need to do a 30 hour boot camp for what I could teach in maybe 45 minutes now. That sounds crazy, but it's like, I can kind of just come in relaxed raise my energy, it raises the student's energy, kind of poke on a few little different understandings that will create cascades of changes. Like I know where like, that one little button is and 30 things just changed that I would have had to mechanically have them memorized by rote for hours when I, you know, when I was younger. One of them would be like the thing I, I taught earlier, who would have the guts to do that, find it funny, focus on, on your orientation of it. You know, remember I said the big thing everyone forgets is focus on your orientation, what you said, how you felt, not you know, their validation. Well, if you get somebody doing that, what happens? They, speak, they become funny, they start becoming gregarious. They have to memorize a million lines. Back in the day, I would have had to teach five million lines earlier in the day to get them to have social skills. You make that one tweak, you do that for three, four nights, and the person's just floating. And then if you, can, if you can really reinforce it to them so they'll keep it, they become very, very powerful. So that's the kind of thing where you can actually resonate with easier solutions, right? 
That is what, in, in for many people, something like, say, a psychedelic does, right? It allow, I've never done it. I've just heard the reports of it. So what I say is meaningless. But from what I read was they realized, wait a minute, I'm not this person. I'm not just Owen. I'm a spirit in a meat sack. I'm not just Owen. My mind can think of different things. Life is not a threat. Not everybody is my enemy. We are all one. There are easier ways of doing this. I'm making this harder on myself than it has to be. There's an ease that I can go through life knowing that I'm a spiritual being, that I'm not confined to just this identity and this set of behaviors, that there's more to me than meets the eye, that there's a feeling of wellness beneath the surface, and that I can think in so many different ways that I had no idea about. Just look at what my mind is capable of. So that's that general idea. The challenge is, is that so many of my friends that go do psychedelics, they stop there. They have that experience. They go, okay, I had that. You know, I realize there's a greater reality. But then the next day, I see them kicking their tire when they got, when they got a parking ticket. Or I see them beefing with people and being negative. What I've seen, many of my friends have very, very real emotional problems. And they'll go, you know, go on their trip and go for a healing. And they'll come back and they'll have a different perspective. But they begin to lose that and fail to integrate it in a deep and meaningful way. Now, they will give, um, they will give a, uh, a guide for doing that. But understand this. A lot of this is also in the marketing. And I'm a marketer, so I will tell you that straight up. Look, let me put it to you this way. Okay, so who in here has done ayahuasca? Put your hands up. Usually in the cell, it's very common. Now, who here, if you did ayahuasca, some of the main selling points on that are, you know, seeing things in a different way, healing, so on and so forth. Let's say that you went to a shaman. Do you do it with a shaman, or who do you do it with? Medicine man. A medicine man. Let's say that that same medicine man gave you MDMA instead of ayahuasca. And he said, this is going to provide a healing. It's going to give you a frame of reference for how loving you could be. But he did that same process, but he guided your way of thinking about it and showed you how to internalize it. Think about that for a moment. Now, would it be different? It'd be very different. Ayahuasca can also show you terrifying things about yourself. It can show you your worst side and rub it in your face. But what it also is, is they're, they're showing you how to think about it. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so they're giving you a framework of how to think about it. I believe that life is actually an ayahuasca journey. I think we're actually all on a drug trip right now. I'm serious. I believe we are on a drug trip. I believe that when you did your ayahuasca journey, you did ultimate version of inception. You're on ayahuasca, and in ayahuasca, you can do ayahuasca. You see what I'm saying? Right? Imagine if inside that ayahuasca, you could do another ayahuasca, right? So I, what I believe, yeah. <laughs> so what I, what I believe is that we are spirits with a body. And so we come here to experience something. And that in effect, what we're experiencing is in this journey, first of all, we have many shortcomings. And that gets smeared in our faces in a very big way while alive. That's one of the benefits of ayahuasca. It's going to take what you're not willing to see. It's too hard to see, and it's going to make you see it. Likewise, in life, we learn about so many different just life lessons, right? We're becoming wise through this experience. And I hate to tell you this, but you might have noticed it. Come on, tell me you've noticed this. In life, you get to have that minute where all your ducks are lined up in a row and a piece. And then right when you wouldn't grow anymore, it ends. I have seen that pattern so utterly consistently in my life. It's like right when everything is right where I'd want it, I, it's almost like I do a quantum leap into the next iteration. It's like you got the lesson, next lesson. It's really trippy. And ironically, each of those lessons is horrible, <laughs> so bad. Ah, so bad. You'd never volunteer for it if you had a choice. Never. You'd back out of it if you could. But because you're forced to, later, you view that lesson as the thing you cherish the most. Thank God I had to go through that. Thank God I got exposed. Now, if you extrapolate this a little bit further, I think that what's very fascinating is to consider 
what your spirit would look like if you didn't have a body. And it's a question I don't really see a lot of people ask. Maybe because it's such a BS foo-foo question, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> right? Maybe that's why. Um, but I still think it's worth considering. So if your spirit wasn't limited by your body, what kind of things would you want your spirit to be prepared towards, right? Well, I think a really, really big one, ironically, for everything that we try to fight for in life, is actually non-attachment. Because if your spirit is floating through the infinite, you couldn't really be too, and again, like, like I just find it weird that like, why have I never really seen a seminar that covered this? Again, I guess it's pretty foo-foo and out there, but I think about this stuff. I don't know, just, I think about a lot of stuff. So this is one thing that I think about, <laughs> right? So what would your spirit look like after you had to let go of your body? Well, you know, your spirit, what would you want it to be like? Well, the first thing I would think of is what is God, right? I'd think that. And I'd think, um, how would I want to resemble the ultimate creator? How would I want to resemble God? I'd want to be a value giver, not a value taker, right? When God created the universe, whatever that force was beyond our comprehension, when God created the universe, that God, he, she, it, whatever it would be, you could go he if you want, but it's whatever it is, the thing, that thing, is it even a thing? I don't, whatever that, you can't even conceive of it, right? It's beyond our ability to conceptualize. It would be just extremely creative, right? It would be creating, I mean, have you seen the, the pictures of the galaxy? It's unbelievable. You ever have a big problem? Go on YouTube, just put like galaxy. <laughs> just type that in. You're like, don't have as much of a problem as I think. Like, like it's, it, it's, it's really crazy. It's like Earth, Mars, um, our solar system, another solar system, then like, Freaking gazillion solar systems make like the Milky Way. And then there's like gazillions of those. And then there's like gazillions of those. Probably not gazillion. Is gazillion even a word? Don't know. But, uh, okay, kind of, kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. But you see the idea, right? Like, go watch this on YouTube. It's trippy. And so, you're, yeah, it's very, very beautiful. And when you realize the scale of this and how small our scale is, and yet despite that our scale is so small, remember that by a way of looking at it, um, it's, it's, it's infinitely smaller than we can conceive of and yet infinitely bigger. Because even though it's small, the meaning to us is still big, right? So it's still meaningful to us. Like our existence is irrelevant relative to the whole galaxy. I mean, like laughably, like hysterically ir irrelevant. Like hysterical times infinity, times infinity, times infinity, hysterical, how irrelevant we are. Like, like to us, an ant's existence, to, to, an, to a being that would see the full picture, we would be less significant than an ant. And yet, with our actual awareness of self that we have, in many ways, that self-awareness and consciousness that we have to whatever degree, which is always in flux, by the way, or the extent to which we're conscious or unconscious or on autopilot, right? But that consciousness that we do have, even in those brief moments, is tremendously significant. So... It's insignificant and yet extremely significant. It's almost like you could imagine something really small merging into something really big and almost wrapping in on itself and back to the small thing. And all of it is part of that bigger whole. You see the imagery there, right? It's like small, expands out big, and kind of like warps back in around on itself to the small. So it's, it's insignificant and yet entirely significant at the same time in a weird way of looking at it, right? You know, so, so you start thinking to yourself, I'll tell you why I use this as a guide, okay? This actually has like a lot of practical implication in my life. So basically then what you have is where you're seeing this, you know, you're seeing it to where, you know, if you were a spirit, you'd want to be able to, you'd want to, be able to think infinitely and have infinite creativity and you'd want to have non-attachment and you'd want to be very value giving because if you're a spirit that's very value taking and rigid, that would be closer to what we would conceptualize in our human conception as satanic. Now, how do I know that that's kind of like a thing? <laughs> You know, the Satan thing's like a thing. I know because I see people that are possessed with that kind of energy all the time. You guys may have even this weekend. <laughs> so, okay. So it's a, it's a, now by the way, people that are very possessed with that low vibration energy are amazing at getting results in this world. So many of my closest friends are people that are possessed with low vibration energy would, 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 would walk out of this talk faster than Dracula runs from a cross, okay? Like, eh! okay, run out. This is stupid, stupid. Are you possessed by Satan? 
Yeah! Okay. So, <clears throat> right, it's not actual Satan, I don't think, but it's like that energy form, right? You can see the shark-like eyes, and they're amazing. Like, look, I still do care about money. The people who I learned the most about money from are people that are kind of dark. I promise you, many of the teachers that I'd refer to you to are incredibly dark. And you'll learn a lot about how to make money from them. Just don't believe that they have the key to life because they do not. They have the key to one part of life, more so than I do. And that's why I'll sit at the foot of the master as well, because I do need to make money. Money's important. So I can learn incredible things from people in that mindset. I also don't want to sit on a park bench for two years, but I love learning from Eckhart Tolle. Don't want to do what he did, but love to learn from the guy. So what you have, you know, many of the great geniuses in certain areas are a bit extreme. Learn from them, but you, you don't need to replicate their whole lifestyle. Now, from that point, people that are in that more darker energy, and you'll see it in them, you'll see it running them. They're rigid, they don't laugh easily, they don't feel joy easily. They'll tell you they're winning in every way possible, but they're not joyful. Their version of winning is just driving themselves to more and more results because they're disconnected from their joy. So they see this sort of thing that shows that they're winning logically, and they go, logically, I'm winning. Now, imagine if you're completely disconnected from presence and joy, okay? You've given up your connection to your higher power. You are disconnected from that. Well, what would you take refuge in now? What would you be looking for for refuge? Drugs. You'd be looking for two things. One, you'd be looking for logically knowing that you won. Like, I have this number, right? I have this number of wins, right? I hooked up this many times. I made this much money. You would need to find refuge in that because you're disconnected from your joy. So you need to logically be able to say that you're winning, right? The, and so you'd be all kind of rigid, like, I am winning. Look at these numbers. Are you unhappy? You'd be happy if you had this. But then you look at their demeanor, you're like, yeah, but you don't look happy. You have black bags under your eyes, your, your pupils look like a shark, and you're super rigid, and you mostly laugh at other people's pain. <laughs> right? You're like, okay. So, but they can still be incredible to learn from. There's still a practical day-to-day -day around it. You might be a spirit, but you still got to pay the rent. <laughs> okay? You can't tell that's your landlord. Like, you can't give this speech to your landlord. You can't give this speech to Whole Foods. Okay? So it's still good to learn from people in that mode. It's, it, levels of energy, Frederick Dawson, he talks about learning from people in different paradigms. You want to have great teachers in different paradigms. There's teachers at higher paradigms than me. Doesn't mean that what I'm saying here is worthless, right? I hope, <laughs> right? There's people at higher paradigms than me. There's value at each paradigm. I love learning from each paradigm, but I'm not copying the lifestyle of each paradigm. So then what you'd look at is you'd say, okay, I want to be very value giving. What do we know about when we give value? We know that we psychologically expand. We know, we, we see the effects it has on our immune system, on our sense of peace, on our sense of joy, on our sense of creativity, on our connection to the infinite. We can see that insofar as when we offer value. Now, we're human beings. We're very limited to what God is, right? We're, 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 in, we're a 0. zeros of zeros of zeros of zeros, 1% of what God is. Like, you know, galaxies full of zeros, 0.1% of what God is. But we do have a tiny little amount of that that we can see in this lifetime. We can connect to that in this lifetime. And we can actually even download that energy a little bit and even bring that into the world and tilt the balance a little bit. Now, I don't believe that this dimension is meant to be all positive. I believe that this dimension is more of a purgatory realm where we're meant to have, we actually come here to have these experiences, right? So you're not trying, that'd be like if you're trying to turn the ayahuasca trip into only positive. That's just called MDMA, right? So now you're trying to turn the ayahuasca trip into MDMA. That's what, when I hear people saying, I want to bring the light of consciousness to the whole world, what I hear is they're trying to ruin the purpose of the world, right? We want, when we are striving to make the world better, my view is that we're actually striving to maintain balance. I believe that evil people and good people will always exist and that they will keep the world in almost perfect balance of good and evil as long as this dimension exists. At times, the dimension will fall into great evil. At times, it will fall into great good. But overall, in the grand scheme of things, I think it'll stay roughly the same because we are here specifically to get lessons. There's probably other dimensions that we would go to where it'd be all positive. But you know what? May not even grow as much there. So understand that, right? Your greatest experiences are not necessarily one where it's always positive. There's, there's a momentum being created spiritually by negative experiences. There's a momentum to it that's very powerful. It's like bouncing a rubber ball off the ground. It shoots up. 
and then it goes up and then you bounce it back harder, bounce it back harder, bounce it back harder. That's the momentum that comes from pain. All of my great growth came from pain. I don't want to, I, I still want to try to make my life better. I don't want to keep repeating pain, burning myself. Oh, I'm tough. But even when you're trying to make your life better, you're going to experience pain anyway. It's going to happen one way or the other. So don't deliberately make your life worse. That pain will come one way or another. So now what we do is we conceptualize what is God? You know, giving, creativity, love, expansion. And in the purification of your own spirit, ask yourself, who am I trying to become through these endeavors? When you're working on things like entrepreneurship, ask yourself, am I doing this just so that I can stack paper and just, I, I, am I doing this to disconnect myself from my emotions, stack paper, and then just say that I'm winning to everyone else? Or am I actually growing internally through this process? Is this entrepreneurial journey feeding me with many different lessons, feeding my creativity, challenging me, stressing me in healthy ways that are providing for healthy, nurturing growth. That's also what going out should be if you're working on your social skills. It's not meant to be just stacking up numbers so you can get further disconnected from your joy. Because see, if what you're doing is you're just trying to go, uh, 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 and you're trying to stack paper, what is the purpose of that? Let's go back to what I said before. When you're disconnected from your higher power and you can't feel that joy of God, of present energy and of the spirit, and you don't even know what that is, and you're so disconnected from it that you think something like that's stupid, you think it's, you, you literally hear that, and you're like, that's dumb, airy fairy. Meanwhile, you can't, you, meanwhile, you lack the joy that that person has, you lack the creativity that that person has, you lack the lateral thinking and expansiveness that that person has, but somehow you think you're winning, right? Okay. It's a rationalization to stay stuck. So because the energy is impacted, sometimes the low vibration energy is so impacted in the person that if you even try to address with them how to change, it snaps back. It snaps, snaps back. Yeah, like that. It shuts it down because the, the energy running them is actually afraid to get extracted because they are, the, the, they are literally shut down to their high vibration energy. They are actually completely unconscious. They are completely unconscious. They have actually invited that energy in to themselves and are completely unconscious. These are people who you'll want to look up to for business advice. These are people who you're going to want to look up to for how to get great social results. And they will, they will lead you to the promised land. They will. They will lead you to the promised land more than you would ever imagine because that's their paradigm. They, have, they are a master of that realm, okay? And that's a realm that you still deal with. But for you, you want it to be one of many paradigms that you're dealing with, not the only paradigm, if you're bought into what I'm saying. Now, you know, it's, a, it's actually a lot of great confusion because over the years, I've gotten to be very, very effective at getting incredible results. So people that are in that paradigm become attracted to my work. They're like, wow, this guy's crushing it. I want to do that. And then they hear all this stuff and it makes them angry. It, it, it actually really messes them up. Likewise, by the way, a lot of very spiritually oriented people see my folks on sales, marketing, money, and business building, and then it throws them off. You know, they'll say to me like, I feel like you're completely present, but you're completely obsessed with business building. I thought when you're spiritual, none of that matters. I'm like, why are you making that distinction? You're crazy. You know, you're too bought in. You're playing a character. You're no different than just someone playing a character. You're playing the namaste character. That whole thing, like, oh, namaste. That you might as well just be a hipster as far as I'm concerned. Right? I'm a hipster. I wear, I drive a fixed gear bike. I drink, what do they drink? Pabst or whatever? No, they drink like that, like, like, like bad beer or something. What is it? What is it? Flat tire. Flat tire. Like, you know, right? Like, like the, you know, I got to, like, I spent $1,000 on my mustache because I don't care. Right? They're playing a character. When I go to Venice, the namaste character, to me, that person might as well just be like a, like a hip hop or goth or, you know, like hipster. They're literally just trying to fit in. They're trying to fit into a scene. They haven't act, they're not actually living a spiritual path or they are to some extent, but they're living the, they're a spiritual path to medicate themselves. They're doing spirituality as medicating pain. So they're constantly coming up with reframes. Everything's a reframe when they're in that mode. Well, this bad thing happened, but all is love. No, bro, when your kid got shot in the head, all's not love. Yes, it is. No, bro, it's not. Your kid got shot in the head. That's not all love, bro. It is in the grand scheme. Okay, just shut up. You're playing a character. It's okay to admit that that sucks. And if you can't, you're playing a character. It's fine. 
What's not okay is to, is to make an identity as a victim and grieve over it for 20 years and have it consume you when if you lost your child, your child would want you to eventually move on. The appropriate response is to, is to have, an, have a, an anchor in presence but still grieve and be sad. Think of what you do different and, and mourn and move past it but in presence and love. It's not to just go, it's all fine, 24 hour day bliss. That's just called a state junkie. You're a drug addict at that point. It's a state junkie. You're attached to feeling in that state all the time. Real enlightenment, in my view, you're not attached to the nirvana all the time. You stay present through the highs and lows of life. You don't hide yourself in an ashram around followers and flowers and then just stay blissed out. You can actually move through life, but there's an anchor of presence that is growing and blossoming and maturing in a proper way. Now, to be fair, I may be wrong. I don't understand all this. I'm not at the highest paradigm of this. I can only share with you how I interpret it at the point that I'm at. So going back, you know, expanding this even further, you go through this period of life and it's like you're on the drug trip and it's meant to show you things. Now, some people, unfortunately, they blind themselves to the lessons and that's where something like a psychedelic may come in for them and actually connect them to those things that they're blocking out because they're hiding from the journey. But what we learn in the journey is what they also have reported in the reports that I read about things like ayahuasca. The major thing, you guys who have, who have experienced that could maybe share with me, is that if you fight the trip, it gets worse. And if you go with the trip and release, it gets better. Is that kind of what you, I get that one? Is, the, is, is, is hip dad catching that, what the kids are doing? Right? Like the dad on the skateboard, like the kids do the ayahuasca, right? I enjoy reading about this stuff. But that's sort of what I interpreted, right? It's like if you fight against it, it becomes worse. If you accept and go with it, that's the better experience is my understanding. Well, I think that's also a principle in life. Life is about learning that balance of going with the journey, right? You go with it. That bad thing happens, accept it and allow yourself to be transmitted into that next life transition. Don't fight against it. And when it hurts, that is a teacher to us, right? It's a teacher. It's saying when you are attached, that's taking you away from your spirit because someday, look, in the life cycle of, the, of, the, of say the galaxy, right? It's like trillions of years, billions of years, whatever it is, right? And remember, there's probably galaxies upon galaxies, right? The big bang, the big rip, it contracts and again and again. Whatever life that you would have or experience of existence after you're dead, and again, I'm just theorizing here. I, no, I, I didn't go, I, I didn't die yet, right? I'm just a guy with an opinion, okay? I'm a, I, I like to speculate, right? In the same way I would have speculated with social dynamics, I like to speculate on this stuff. This is a, there's, there's things I would teach you that are objective fact. This is a speculative seminar. Any seminar that would be teaching to the, you this as a fact, that's called a cult leader, okay? I'm not, I'm not <laughs> damn it, right? But you, okay, but you know, but you see, yes, now, okay, ah, okay, I'm just sharing you ways I've thought about my life, right? Look, we've had, you know, somebody who might watch this video might think this is all we talk about. This weekend, we talked about many different topics for many hours, did many exercises. So this is just simply one cool little area that we can explore. So we can explore things that we know a little bit closer to objectively, but we can also conceptualize things that are maybe a little bit more subjective. Some of which you'll resonate with, some of which you won't, and that's fine. Even if you didn't resonate with one drop of what we talked about here, it would still show you a process where you're like, that guy's pretty creative. You know, just thinking outside of this, you know, kind of synthesizing things that I've read, things that I've experienced, things that I've, I've seen in, in a YouTube video, things I've read in a book, but also a lot of firsthand stuff and extrapolating that, right? I've been through that kind of meat grinder of ups and downs, right? I've seen that great bliss in life. I've seen great pain in life. I've seen how you can go into almost a heaven on earth state when you go into a collaborative frame. And I've also seen how you can go into a hell on earth state in a competitive frame. But I've also seen it where when I get too much in the collaborative frame, I can't pay my bills, okay? So there's a little bit of both that are there, right? And, and in life, you know, you could almost look at the cross like the breadth and the depth this is like the physical plane. This is the spiritual plane. This is, this is the depth of it. Some people are just living at the surface. Some people are just living at the depth. In a cross, that's like the intersection between spiritual versus the physical. I think that, that's the way that I take that as a symbol. That's what I see across. That's my symbol of it. Not just someone hanging on a cross, but that's the way that I symbolize that in my mind. So as I'm going through life, I'm looking to master the physical as to whatever extent I'm capable. And then I'm also looking to go, to go deeper. So a big part of my life is, you know, when I'm sitting there looking at my hands, I know this would sound weird, but I want to look at my hands in a deep and profound way. You know, I want to be able to look at the water in a profound way. Like if I take a sip of the kombucha, 
Remember, if I'm disconnected from my emotion, I can buy the $4 kombucha, but I don't have a palate for it. So I'm looking to go deeper with my palate of life, the palate of it, right? The, the, the taste buds of life. If you're walking down the beach, you can be trapped up in your head thinking about answering text messages, thinking about that last person that made you angry, or you can be really soaking in and getting the juice out of life with every moment you have. We, so, we talk so often about getting more money and having more clout and popularity, fame, worship, whatever, but when do we actually stop and think, how much are you enjoying what you actually have? When someone tells you, oh, I just work 20 hours a day, they're probably not stopping to smell the roses that much. They're getting off on just literally seeing that paper stack up, not realizing that there could be an economic meltdown someday and all that paper could be gone, or society would collapse, and what would it have amounted to? However, society hasn't collapsed as of today, so there's still practical day-to-day -day concerns. That's why you go back to, again, the depth and the breadth. It's both. You want to have balance. And by the way, when you abandon the breadth, you miss out on lessons. You're hiding yourself. You're medicating. So again, as we said, we go into things like climaxing, intimacy, food. The ultimate one is hardcore drugs. And I'm not talking teacher plants and healing plants. I'm talking drugs. <laughs> okay? Heroin, cocaine, meth, all that stuff. What does that do? If you were to take heroin, never done it, I would predict what it probably does is makes you feel like a warm blanket of love and joy all over your body. And what's happening is it's really medicating that pain. Here's the challenge. When you do something like that, you are rewiring attachment in such a big way. The ultimate thing you'd get attached to would be something like heroin, fentanyl, crystal meth. The, the, the recovery rate off those is frighteningly, frighteningly low. And by the way, even if you ever get off one of those things, the amount of willpower that you would exert to just stay clean on heroin, like to drive Uber and just stay clean, you'd probably be exerting more willpower than Elon Musk to change the world. Like the amount of willpower Elon exerts to run three businesses is probably less than what a heroin addict does to drive Uber and just not do heroin. So that's why you want to avoid something like that, like the plague. And if you're on it, get off. Because the attachment, if you think it's hard enough just being attached, you know, to getting into Prime 112 for a nice steak, you think that's an attachment. Talk about hard drugs. And it's, it's both, it's physically addicting you, but it's also psychologically addicting you because it's training you to find that envelopment in present energy and escape from the, the harshness of life. It's training you to find that in a substance. It's training you not to learn how to get present yourself. Talk about disconnecting you from your higher power in the most profound way you could ever do. Drugs. Because literally, it's giving you everything you could want. That feeling right now. You don't need to work on it. You don't need to purify the spirit. And you see in many ways, people that get hooked on hard drugs, it's as if they live in hell on earth. So what do we see from people that are using hard drugs? It is very much a hell on earth type of experience. And so what happens is they're in these highs and lows. They go high, 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 and then they lose it. And they're continually in that land of hungry ghosts. That's an analogy in Buddhism, this like little character with a big belly, but this long mouth. And it can never get enough to fill its belly. They call that the land of hungry ghosts, okay? And they're literally floating through this freaking mirage, attached, 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 attached. Now, when we look at spiritual growth, people that are hardcore drug addicts, we can see that in many ways, as that hell energy on this earth. We can see that, right? If you want to go even deeper, by the way, into really satanic energy, we can look at people who gain energy from harming innocence, okay? Um, you know, disgusting, horrific acts of traumatizing children irreversibly, hurting other people, and literally a satanic type, because I don't believe in like, Satan like, Rah! like that necessarily. I'm not saying, I, I don't like not believe it, I just don't have an opinion. But that kind of energy that's, that's thought of or conceptualized as Satan, <clears throat> you know, we can very much see that as far as somebody who is even getting off on harming others. And we have people like that in this world. They literally get energized 
from harming others. Or someone with, say, narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, you try to argue with them. You ever try to argue with like a proper narcissist? Yeah. It's like you're fighting a shark in their world, yeah. right? You're in the world of the shark swimming, like trying to whack it. Like if you fought the shark in your world on the beach, you'd kick its, you'd, you'd, you'd kick its butt, right? But in the water, it's gonna kick your butt, it's gonna win. If you are a positive person and you're arguing against a narcissist or playing a sociopath's game in their world, they're gaining energy. You're yelling at them and like, oh, I'm gonna teach them a lesson and yell at them and intimidate them. You're thinking you're gonna outdo them? No, you're in their world, you're giving them energy. They get off on that. So, that, so, so some people, we can gain energy by sharing, right? We share, we make the world better with love and we gain energy. But some people at the other end of that spectrum are actually gaining energy from doing harm, right? So what you can see is many of these different things. We can actually see these on earth and say, well, what direction am I going? Where am I going? And you've got to ask yourself with each action that you're taking, with every action, where is this leading you? Now, I'll promise you that if we had like, if God was here right now, and he did an audit, this was, if this was an essay, and God was grading me on how much I got right and wrong in this speech, I'm probably getting a D. But most people are getting an F, okay? So I don't know all the bigger picture of life, but most people, they're so disconnected from that, they're just basically spinning their tires in the mud. They're going through the motions for no actual outcome. There's a lot of, it's this worthless action that they're taking. It's a lot of movement, a lot of stuff's happening. It's just a lot of busy work. There's a great movie that came out called uh, The Irishman on Netflix. I actually happened to catch it in the theaters. It's, uh, it's kind of like the final movie, I would assume, directed by Martin Scorsese with uh, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci. And the movie, it's a great movie, because I, I love Casino and Goodfellas, but it's also a great movie because the first two thirds it's kind of like a slow burn kind of movie, more about the subtleties. And the first two thirds are maybe a little bit more similar to Godfather or, or to, um, to uh, Goodfellas or Casino. It's still a much slower burn and very subtle movie, slower moving. But the last third, and here's the kind of ultimate piece. The last third, Robert De Niro, and go watch this. Robert De Niro's character, it shows him in an old person's home. And he's outlived all the people that were his fellow gangsters. And Jimmy Hoffa and Joe Pesci, I think they give him this one watch. One of them gives him a watch. Is it a watch or bracelet? I can't remember. Some kind of watch, and it symbolizes his part of this like moral code. And then Hoffa, or the other one, also gives him, like it was a ring or a watch. And so he, ha so he has this one kind of piece of jewelry from the mob and another one from Hoffa. But Hoffa and all his mob connections are, are long dead. And for that last hour, he just sits there rotting in the meaninglessness of his life. Yeah, he just, and, 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 and the jewelry, the two pieces that he got, are there to symbolize that it's like there was this code and he did all this stuff, but Hoffa's dead, the mob people are dead, and this was just a whole bunch of action for a code that no one cares about anymore that no longer has any meaning, a whole bunch of stuff happened and there was no point at all. He dies alone, wishing his daughter would talk to him and it's meaningless. And you have to remember that Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, Al Pacino, they're a little bit closer to that phase of their lives now, right? There's probably fewer days ahead than behind for them, right? And they're left there to reflect on what did all of this mean? What was the purpose of all this? And they've got to come to grips with that themselves. You know, a great director like Martin Scorsese, he's got to own, I made all these movies. Was there a point? He's got, and he's got to have to come direct face to face with that. And that's pretty heavy stuff to look back at your life. And for some of us, we don't even make it that far to even have that chance. So, you know, some of us is cut short. Probably most of you in this room have lost friends at some point, right? Some of us in this room could be gone. I'll promise you, people watching this on a video could be gone. Someone. You never think it's going to be you. That couldn't be me. It could. Okay? I hope it's not. But someone draws that short straw. Okay? Knock it quick. He'll save you. So, okay, so understand that the direction that you're going in life, 
as you approach the end of your life, you've got to ask yourself, how are you doing inside yourself? What did this lead to? What was the point of this? Was this just me getting over a bunch of people? And I can tell you, look, I had an experience where I got hit by a car and I thought I was gonna die. And the two things that I cared about was the legacy of positivity that I left and the people who I loved and the love that was in my heart. Those were, I, I can tell you, I believed I was gonna die. I was covered in blood, I couldn't breathe. I believed I was, I was in bed for about two, three months after. I believed I was gonna die. I, I, I didn't just believe I was gonna die. Like, I knew I was dead. I'm like, okay, this is it. And in that moment, what was so clear to me was that most of my life was a lie because I was going through all these motions, but it wasn't, it, it, it was completely pointless. What was the point of all this? It was literally, there was no point. But what did have a point was the love in my heart and the positive legacy I had left behind. That was what mattered to me. So that's what I'm trying to get at you here is that realize that you are in a psychedelic journey right now and your weaknesses are gonna get put in your face and relentlessly and it's gonna hurt. And what you're gonna take from that are many different lessons. That's okay. Keep improving. You don't, you don't need to run towards pain to find pain. You, you know? It'll find you. Yeah, it'll find you. So understand that, that you're in the process of getting many lessons and the lessons are on the spiritual and the physical. Learn about how you're carrying yourself in your energy but also learn about simple cause and effect. I brought in many speakers here this weekend that taught you about raw cause and effect because I believe in that equally. I choose who I let speak on the stage. And I bring in people that are gonna show you this side in a big way because it's equally important. Equally important, just different. But understand that as you're going through those motions, there's a grander vision of what it is that you're trying to create as a legacy and who you are that you're becoming in your spirit as far as purifying all that darkness, that takerness, that smallness. The biggest thing that I learned in all my years of working on my social skills was I go to a, a bar club and on some nights I'd feel like I'm against everybody. And on other nights I'd feel like I'm friends with everybody. We call that the competitive versus collaborative frame. And in that competitive frame, I was in a state of fear. And I could find ways to push over that with different systems and whatnot, but it was always from the most contracted place. The higher paradigm that I found that was so beautiful was one where I realized that we're all one under the surface. And what I realized was that I could share, be free, be unstifled. I found that my voice would open up. I'd have jokes for days. I'd, I would prance around there like just the happiest person, like Captain Jack Sparrow or something, you know? Right, just having fun, you know? Probably having even more fun than that, to be honest. And just loving it, having way too much fun. And, and ironically, the results that I was getting as far as meeting new people went through the roof anyway. So it's like you're manifesting these amazing, amazing results. So that's what I wanna to try to lead you towards here and look at that bigger picture. So we did a talk here, we covered creativity and different pra practical and pragmatic ways to be more creative. And also we use that to go even a little bit deeper and look at the way that your life could have a much larger context. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do some exercises, uh, but how do you guys enjoy the talk? You enjoy this little section? Yeah.